Going live, going live. Be going live here very soon. Yes. Doug. What's up, Todd? How you doing, bro? I probably should have put some words on here so people would know what we were doing. But they'll figure it out. What's going on, man? Yeah, so I wanted to talk about some of the stuff, maybe like the KLOA things. And I know a couple other guys like uh, agreed to testify against Miski too, like in the last day or so. Yeah, man, there's a, there's a bunch of new stuff. I, I, I went like two months without any updates and um all of a sudden in the same week we have like two new well first of all we have jake smith turns federal witness and is testifying against mike miski then we got two new guys that are involved in the miski conspiracy and the miski enterprise who come out of the woodwork and are testifying against him in a kidnap in one of the kidnapping cases and the drug dealing cases and then we have Catherine Kailoa doesn't talk to her attorney. No one knew what to make of that. And then she gets her sentencing. And then Louis Kailoa gets his sentencing. And then Derek Hahn and um, the other gentleman are both getting his sentencing this week. They already did, apparently. So just, I guess, when it rains, it pours. Who were the? Who, did they identify who the other two were that came out of the woodwork? Miski. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I'll make sure I get the names right. Um, and if you guys that are in here that watching this want to ask any questions, just feel free to do so. That's kind of why I'm doing these. Not really so I can ask stuff. If you guys have anything you want to ask, Doug can't see the questions, but I can. I'll just read them. That's the whole point of me doing these lives. How's it been going? I noticed you've been doing a lot of li uh, a lot of lives. Yeah, I've been doing those with people that I've already done podcasts with or stuff just to kind of see if anybody wants to ask some questions. You know, because when I do a podcast, it's just me talking to them. Right. So, yeah, maybe somebody has questions they want to ask. Um, so how does that work is – um your all of your followers and my followers get a notification so it'll show up in the live bar yeah they can see it yep okay yeah if you're talking to anybody whoever you talk to they can see theirs kind of thing so maybe some of your followers might want to ask you something here i don't know we'll see yeah hopefully yeah there's a few people jumped in so Let's see if anybody has something they want to add um so do you get this news? Like, uh, I do, but I haven't been following a lot of news lately. Maybe I should, <laughs> you know, but, but I mean, out in your, are you, are you in Tulsa? Yeah. So do you get, has any of this Hawaii news made national news? I wouldn't say so. No, I, you know, I, I think, yeah, I mean, it's a little strange. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what they consider to be interesting. And all you people coming in here, if you want to ask questions, please ask something. You know, if you have any questions about any of these cases or anything you want to talk about. So uh, apparently um, a drug dealer who flew from Hawaii to California named Jonah Ortiz, he's 41, so he's like two years older than me, three years older than me. He pled guilty to federal kidnapping and drug conspiracy charges. And this was in October of 2017. So I was still with the department. I was still in Honolulu. And him and his co-defendant, Wayne Miller, who I'm familiar with, just because his name was floating around. He's, he, was, he was always up to no good. He 
him, Wayne Miller, and Jonah Ortiz now agree to cooperate fully and testify against Miller. Um, or against Miski. And they, I remember when I read the initial charge paperwork, they talked about this being a kidnapping case. I just assumed, along with probably everybody, that that kidnapping case was about Johnny um, Frazier, which is the boy that right. is believed to have been murdered by Miski and his crew. So we, I think everyone just assumed that that was the kidnapping case, but apparently this is its own case. I guess what happened here is Ortiz and Miller, these two guys that recently flipped, they were arrested in August of 2018, almost a year after they took place of, they took um, part in kidnapping that businessman in Honolulu. And I guess they had flown back to Hawaii from buying drugs in California. Um, Mike Miskey had already been named in a secret indictment for financing that whole drug ring, which right. this is like the key to everything that came crashing down. Um, but they hadn't publicly charged him yet. So this was a sealed indictment and they were watching him at this point. And so Ortiz pleaded guilty in open court. And in exchange for that guilty plea, they dropped all charges against him, including the 2018 drug case. So they had him on this 2018 drug case, and then they caught him flying back to Hawaii with drugs in 2000 <laughs> and whatever that was. So they agreed to drop it all just so that he would cooperate against Miski. So it's funny because, like, I'm not a real big um, – drug war guy i'm not a huge fan of like the drugs being such a kind of like the engine that drives a lot of arrest um in the criminal justice community but it's so valuable to catching bad guys it's just it is what it is man these guys that the easiest way to screw up and get caught is drugs and so unfortunately like good people who maybe smoke marijuana or whatever they get caught up and they get caught into this system and that's why it's been such a rocky road for the marijuana community but unfortunately that's like the way that we get these bad guys who they clean up after they kill people. They leave no traces. They do all that stuff. But they get caught flying back to Honolulu on a plane with drugs in their pocket. And that's just how we get them. And this is what happened here. So Now, does Miski have any chance of, like, testifying against Kay Aloha or any of these people, you think, or no? He oh, he's, he's going right? to testify. He's going to testify against them. But he's not going to get out of, like, they might take the death penalty off the table. Like, at at the point, it seems to me like Miski's the big fish that they're trying to go after. It just, it's a sexier case. It is, it's made for TV, honestly. So I think, I think Catherine Kellow is going to testify against Mike Miski, not the other way around. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think she's going to be the first one to say, this is what I know. And then they're going to go after him. And they're going to, she's going to work with information she has to lessen her sentence. And she's doing 13 years. Um, and that's just on this case. That's just on the bank fraud case. Yeah, I heard you say you thought more was coming for her. Well, we have other cases. Unfortunately, those were closed. I mean... They weren't closed, but those were as a part of her plea deal. So she pled and they agreed to not. She pled guilty to lesser charges, essentially. But um, she has like a, pe a dr pending drug case. Her brother is a, do a pain management doctor uh, on a different island in Hawaii. So there was some kind of scandal with him getting her prescription pills and other people prescription pills mm. and trafficking 
narcotics, which is like a real deal, big problem. So that she wouldn't have to go through another case and all that other stuff. They bundled it all together and it's part of her sentencing. Now, I think what's coming more from her is going to be what we find out from Mike Miskey's case. And I think what's going to happen is if I had to guess, all these dudes that are flipping on Mike Miskey are going to somehow involve Catherine Killaw. She's going to fight it and act like it wasn't anything, just like she did on this last case and plead not guilty and the whole deal. But then the moment they nail her with it, she's going to plead and then she's going to testify against Mike. So if I had to guess based on what she did in this case, like she went all, I mean, they took this case all the way right up until the end. They were saying they didn't do anything wrong. They're going to have their day. They look forward to their day in court, that whole deal. And then when it all came crashing down, all of a sudden they're apologizing and saying I'm wrong. That's obviously them posturing because they want to, they wanted a lesser sentence, but it didn't work in the case of, of this judge. He actually gave them more time than what was recommended. So this one's going to be interesting. I, I feel like, if I'm being honest, Louis K. Law, um, he was, I feel like he was just trying to take care of his wife. And he still did it. It was still wrong. And he put lives in danger. And he put, he stole Ger Gerard Puano's life and took years from him and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's why he's in jail. And he should be. Um I'm just saying he wasn't like the bully behind all this. It does seem like from my perspective that she was getting in over her head and taking everyone down with her. She was addicted to prescription drugs. Um, she was wrapped up with Mike Miskey. She was getting reckless. She had stolen $600,000 from um, her grandmother. And she had also stolen like $165,000 from these poor kids that she was named executor to their, financial yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and she was supposed to take care of them she stole that money too and so she has to pay that back um her and louis kello agree to separately pay back that hundred and sixty five thousand. i think each of them have to pay one hundred sixty five thousand, or maybe it's two hundred and sixty five thousand, something like that but yeah i thought where kello is going to make like almost 10 grand a month you know behind bars from his uh pension yeah so that all depends on like how much he worked the honolulu the honolulu police department how their pension works under the old contract and he wasn't remember he made it to chief so as soon as you make captain you leave the union that the rest of the police officers are in as soon as you make captain you're considered supervisor just like many other union type jobs he's considered brass management but at the Honolulu Police Department, they go off your high three years, the average of your high three years with overtime. That's on your that's on the last contract that I was a part of. Everyone after me, I think after the 172 class, they had high five years, no overtime. So you had to be straight. The average of your highest five earning years, base pay, which base pay is like seventy thousand dollars or seventy five thousand dollars. By the time you graduate, maybe eighty, eighty-five thousand dollars. I mean, by the time you retire, probably eighty-five thousand, eighty, eighty-five thousand, um, which isn't a lot in Honolulu. Um, right, right, right. So my, more than I was making. <laughs> well, when I, well, the thing is, you know, a big part of the problem is the military's BAH. I mean, people can't survive; they can't pay rent in Honolulu or in in Oahu, anywhere in Hawaii, really, for that matter, because the military. Do you know what BAH is in Hawaii? Uh, you know, I don't even remember what I was getting. I mean, that's sad that I don't remember kind of what I was getting. I was living out in town. Um, Dude, know, it's, it's $2,900 right now. Yeah, I was able to keep, you know, whatever I didn't spend as to where right. I just, and they only give you what you need and that's it. Ooh, so you, take, that. you take your agreement, you know, whatever it costs, you take it to the housing office and that's all they give you. Wow. But in Hawaii, you can keep whatever you do. So if your apartment's seven hundred bucks, you keep the rest. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know a lot of guys who you know would just rent five deep and then s save their money. Um, but because landlords know 
they're getting 2,900. You should see if you just search like rent. I, I don't know what it is, but when I left, it was 2,900. Yeah, when I got out of the military, though, I wasn't getting that. I was living on very little, you know. When did you get out? I got out in 2005, you know, and I went to college in Hawaii. And Where'd yeah, you go? So, oh, I went to KCC and UH. Yeah. No way. Yeah, and uh, I was getting uh, GI Bill money, enough GI Bill money to where I really didn't have to work. But it wasn't a lot, you know, I was getting by on a few thousand a month, you know. So how long were you there? Uh, first time was, uh, 96 to 2002. Then I went to Japan for three years. Then I separated in Hawaii, 2005. And I just stayed there till 2013. Oh, I didn't yeah, know you were there. 14 then. years. So you and I lived there same time. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. That's insane. You know, but I wasn't someone who was, at least while you were probably there, I wasn't necessarily out and about as much probably, you know, as, you know, at that time. What were you doing? Where did where did, what did you spend most of your time doing out there? Uh, well, I was training and stuff. And uh, where were you, you know, training? Uh, I trained at a, up at several gyms. So the first one, when I first came back, was this small gym in Eva Beach with a guy named Barrett Yoshida. But he moved to San Diego. He got a job teaching in San Diego at uh, Undisputed Gym, and then I think he's at the arena now. And uh, then I went and I trained uh, at TJ Thompson's gym, which is called Icon Sport Fitness Gym. He opened it in, I want to say 2008, you know, so, but that gym only lasted like a year. And then I went and trained with Paul Leno. I don't know if you know who he is. He was a, he's a sheriff or something. He works with the no. sheriffs. Why? How do you spell and, his last name? A-N-O. And uh, yeah, he's a big, real muscular guy. I know he was... You know, he works with the sheriffs, and I think he worked at uh, maybe Halava Prison. And uh, so I trained with him for a few years, and then I went to the UFC gym. And I trained there for, like, the last two or three years I was in Hawaii. The one in Kaka'ako, you know. Yep. So that was pretty much – I mean, I lived right off of, you know, the – you know where Club 9, 939 is? Yeah, 939 Camel. Right across the street from it, that building there. The Tanabi yeah. building yeah. with the Fujima service. Yajima I, know, service station. I know exactly what you're talking about. <clears throat> I lived in that building. Um, yeah, the owner I... there, the guy who originally owned the building was a Japanese guy, you know. When I was in the military, I moved in there. I lived on the seventh floor. And then when I came back from Japan, you know, I contacted him. And uh, he said, yeah, I'll give you. He remembered who I was. They had a wait list, but he said, you know what? You want to move in here, no problem. You know? So he just was like, yeah, I'll let you in because I remember you. And yeah, he's a cool guy. And then he sold the building. Yeah, but that. But own shop on the bottom, the Tanabi shop. Yeah, and then the back balcony, it overlooks like the parking lot, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we got, we went to that building all the time. <laughs> um, but I never <laughs> noticed it over there, you know what I mean? But that was my, that was my beat. So when I first came out of, Actually, when I was in my FTO phase, my last phase, um, I was 176. And that's 176 is easily like the busiest nighttime beat um, on the island at the time. And daytime, it's 180, which is like the Ala Moana area. Mm -hmm. um, but 176 was that area. And I remember my, my FTO, his name was Galen Kaneshi. And there was a bunch of different types of FTOs you could get. Like, there's always dudes who would flex on you and really sweat you hard and make you feel like you were failing. And he was definitely that guy. He, he made me feel like I was failing every day. I thought I was not going to make it. But apparently that's, that was just his style because he passed me at the end. And um, I remember him telling me, like, my first or second day, he's like, you got to memorize. I want you to memorize this beat which is literally like P.E. Koi to basically just past the, the Pagoda. Do you remember the Pagoda Hotel? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So from like Pagoda to P.E. Koi, from King Street all the way to Kapilani. And it's a, it's a huge beat. And there's a bunch of streets and plus all the businesses or whatever. So he's like, you got to memorize this beat or I'm going to fail you. And I stressed out. And I remember coming home and I took the map and I drew it out on a piece of paper about a thousand times 
Um, I didn't get any sleep. And I came in the next day and he's like, do you, did you memorize the beat? So he wanted me to draw it freehand. So I would draw my beat freehand without looking at the map. And there was, I don't know, 30 streets or something. Yeah. And um, would you, would you know that I remember I used to talk all this trash about him to everybody. Like Galen, everyone would say, dude, you got Galen. You must be having a hard time. Like, I feel sorry for you. Just keep your head up. You know, there's life after Galen. Don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. You'll feel like a human again. And so I was like, I knew I got stuck with this dude. Everyone said they put you with him because they wanted, they want you to quit or they wanted him to fail you. Like he's, you're really being tested. Somebody doesn't like you. That was like the vibe they made. I don't know if that was true. I doubt it. <laughs> but um, about six months later or a year later, I did a speed, I did a basic speed roll case where I caught a guy racing up Kaheka which is a small little street that runs north and south and just to the east or just to Cocoa Head of Kamoku Street. And he's got to be, I don't know. All I know is I floored it. I was trying to catch him and I floored it and he was getting smaller in my windshield. So I'm driving a Crown Vic. I'm flying. I'm doing like 60 and he's getting smaller. And this is only like a few streets long. Yeah. So the long story short is I go up on stand Apparently, I pull him over. He's driving an M5, brand new M5, all, gra all um, what's it called, carbon fiber. Like, it must have been a $120,000, $130,000 car in, in 2012. And he hired – his dad owned, like, the largest construction company or whatever. And he hired this high-power attorney. And I go up on the stand – and I remember the lady says to me, how um, do you know that you were on a city and county roadway? Because that's one of the major <laughs> things about one of the elements of the crime is you like Kona Street, you know, Kona Street. Yes. Yeah. That's a private roadway. So I can't pull you over for speeding or running stop signs. Because those aren't city and county roadways. And I only have jurisdiction in the city and county of Honolulu. So on Oahu, if it's public. So she said, were you on a city and county roadway that day? I said, yeah. She said, how do you know? And I said, due to my training and experience. But, bro, honestly, I didn't. I didn't know. And as soon as she asked me that question, I'm thinking, dude, I have no idea. I'm a, I thought, I think it is because it's like a main road. But there's really no way to tell sometimes. So I was like, well, due to my training experience. And I'm in a courtroom full of people. And she said, well, if you're so trained and experienced, could you draw for me the beat you were working that day? And I could hear angels singing, dude. <laughs> and I was like, well, yes, I can. And yeah. it got quiet. It was like a movie. She pulled out an easel and had me draw in front of the court the beat that I was working that day. And I drew, I drew every street. I drew the crosswalks. I drew where the people were. And she rested her case. And then afterwards, the prosecutor came to me and she was like this is my first case and my supervisor told me i was going to lose because we never win basic speed rule and he's like the reason we won that case is because you were able to draw your beat she's like how did you know how to draw your beat like it and i told her the story about galen kaneshi oh i hated that guy for the longest time but after that case i remember thinking this guy is as much of a douche as he was being it helped me out I think there's some memorable places in that area, though. It's a pretty seedy area, you know, at night Dude. especially. Well, I don't yeah. know if we were having many game room problems but when you were there, but that's game room central right now. Yeah. Um, we have, if you take Rycroft, um, Evabound, from your place, like I'm talking Rycroft, Kemoku, right? And yeah. you go, you go Evabound that little street where all those little houses are, it's like a weird residential street in the middle of all these areas. They were full of game rooms. And I used to just sit there and pick people off. Dudes would come out with hundred thousand dollar warrants, $50,000 warrants, you know, $200,000 warrants. And I just knew the warrant page. So I would just have the warrant page up and I'd seem like, Oh, that's the guy. And I'd pick them off because they just hang out in the game rooms. Yeah. So it became like a fishing hole. You were right in the center of it. And at nighttime, I don't know how you slept. Cause it gets, it's crazy over there. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Sometimes if we're earplugs or whatever, you know, you know, I heard the leaky drive-in was closing. Leaky leaky oh, drive-in. Yeah. Yeah. Which I is mean, sad. That's kind of 
place where you, you, you could walk pretty much anywhere you didn't if you didn't feel like parking. You know, just oh, yeah. walk outside and walk to wherever you felt like going, you know? Yeah, man. That At was the, the place. time I liked it, you know, because I could walk to the mall. I could walk to wherever. I could walk to Waikiki if I wanted to, you know? Yeah, but, that's a little bit of a walk, but yeah. Yeah, it's it's not bad. And, you know, you could just go anywhere you wanted to, you know, and not really – you know, need to park, you know, because parking is such a pain in the ass there. So is that does anybody where, is have that, any questions for Doug? Like, is that the I only place you live, Tom? Huh? Is that the only place you lived? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I was on the base for a long time, and then I wanted to move off. I moved into that building the first time. Where were you at? Uh, on base? Uh, oh, I was at Pearl Harbor. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I moved in the building the first time. And then when I came back from Japan, I stayed in the house in Glee for maybe a couple of months. And it was like a real world house, you know, have like all these people from different. Yeah. But I didn't know any of them. You know? Where were you at in Kali? Man, I couldn't even tell you, you know, were you, were you by KPT? Uh, you know, the yeah, I, I would say down the road. Yeah. Near the uh, shopping center. Oh, near camp shopping, shopping center. Yeah. Yeah. Right near there. Yeah. Um, that's, that's where, that's where this Miski has a whole thing about meeting up yeah. at camp shopping center. Yeah. And conspiring to do his stuff. Camp, Camp Shopping Center. I used to live on Rose Street, which is the street, I think it's called Lena Puni, that goes to KPT. So I lived on the street that KPT was on in a sketchy, I mean, <laughs> it was the sketchiest neighborhood I ever lived in in my whole Great. life. Yeah. And I grew up in Detroit. And... It was it was super sketch, but every night the alarms would go off. People would pull the fire alarms at KPT, and it'd just be like bells ringing all night. Um, I've seen them light diapers on fire and throw them off the top of KPT, and you see it looks like Baghdad. It's like bombs dropping. <laughs> it was the I have a I have a shirt that just says Rose Street. I like to rep my my neighborhood. I think I live in that building because it's pretty convenient, you know, like the rent and the utilities, it all came together. And uh, they had like maid service. They had ladies that worked there that would clean the rooms. It was like a hotel, kind of. No way. Yeah, yeah. So they cleaned the rooms like once a week, you know. I think that's so called a brothel. Convenient. Huh? I think that's called a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> no, pretty convenient. You know, they bring your mail, you know. It's kind of like living yeah. in a small hotel, you know. The room was tiny, kind of like yeah. this room. But the whole apartment was like this room, you know? Wow, yeah. In, so. Mine was 400 square feet. It was 20 by 20, two bedroom, because I had babies. And, man, did I have drama. I had to get a TRO on a guy who told me he was going to rape my son. <laughs> he was like, I had a one-year-old. Yeah. And he, he it got pretty sketchy over there. And I had to get a TRO. I had to go to court. Um, there was fights every night gunshots um once i slept in i i, I slept in I, I thought i thought it was my day off it wasn't and when you're a police officer that's not okay because they will send officers to look for you so if you don't show up and you won't answer your phone call they send your b partners to go to your house the problem is you know how the addresses are in kalihi i lived at 2423 rose street apartment c3 but there's like A through A one through A twenty nine, B one through B sixty two, and then C one through whatever. And I was C three around some corner, and I just remember one. Day, I remember waking up. It's like six in in the morning, and I hear Doug, Doug, and I look out, and like hundred yards away in some courtyard. You know those Filipino mansions that are like, you know, ten thousand square foot homes with no yeah. lawn. Like they build right up to the property line. They sh and I hear them screaming from like a courtyard looking for me because they didn't know where I lived. And so you I lived like a walk up. Oh yeah, I lived in a walk up with my washer and dryer beneath my stairs on the outside of my house, which was hard, which was weird to get used to. Yeah, like the other thing about that building, I was like, nobody's gonna break into my room here, you know? Like, yeah, tall building, you know? Yeah, unless they live there. That's yeah, the other thing. They live there exactly. We had plenty of people that would break into other apartments in their complex but you were there before security cameras were like easy to grab and everyone had 
a security camera. That's how it was for me. But now, dude, everyone's got a ring. Everyone's got something. I'm still in stuff Hawaii. It's, it, all that is is like ring camera footage of dudes stealing slippers, stealing cat catalytic converters, whatever. It's too hard to be a burglar now. <laughs> so, so you think like uh, for like this Miski trial, you think that he's going to be the guy they're going to go after, not Kealoa, basically? Right. Listen, man, he's the one making moves. He was – he was – Catherine Kealoa is a master manipulator. She's like – She's like a first degree black belt in manipulation. But Mike Miski is like a fifth degree black belt in manipulation. So um, even though she is higher in the food chain, she was just a utility for him. I mean, let's be honest. Like, so the, the rumors were that he was sleeping with her. I heard that as far back as 2016, right? Yeah. I remember being, I remember trying to wrap my brain around it because she's not exactly a looker for a dude like Mike Miski, right? Who has like power and money and he's younger, like he looks younger. He's all always around young people. Yeah. Um, if you look at his girlfriends, they're always like pretty girls. And then why would he be sleeping with Catherine Kayla? I, I just couldn't ever figure it out. And I just realized like, Mike did what he had to do to be able to reach the people he needed to reach. So I really think that Catherine was just somebody he used and she was easily manipulatable. And probably a lot of it had to do with the drugs. Like we know she's addicted to prescription pills. She's getting them from her, her brother on, I think it was big Island. And you know, she just, she was losing control at this time. By then she's already been um, being watched. She'd already been indicted. You know what I mean? She already had, um, attorneys or whatever, like her life's falling apart. It's spiraling out of control. Mike Miski slides in and then she starts making like super re reckless moves. Like it really messed me up when she called my friend while he was working and told him to back off of Mike Miski. That's, I remember, I remember that one hit me because I was like, you know, there's nothing they won't do. There's nothing that they won't do if they're going to do something like that. How does my friend who is a police officer and it's dangerous for people to have that kind of information on him. Like people don't like police officers anyway. So you try to, you remove all your social media, you write all the companies that have things posted about you and you ask them to remove it. Like there's a process that you can do to get yourself removed because dude, people I'm telling you, you give a ticket to the wrong dude and then he looks you up and he shows up at your house. He could just be putting, you know, paper bags full of dog crap on your porch or he could be throwing rocks to your window or you could get shot in the head one day. Like, you know, yeah. Troy Barboza. And you think about that while you're going to the, on the beat every day. Like I'm testifying against, I put a dude in jail for 30 years for a serial rape for, for a serial rape charge. He's got family. Like he's a big Samoan guy. He's got plenty, all his family yeah. lived with him. You know what I mean? And think about it. If you're, if you got a tight family and your brother's going to jail and you're that kind of dude, you make that witness go away. That's not uncommon to try to do that. So you really try to protect yourself. And the fact that you could go through all that and then somehow some chick on the inside, like Catherine Killaw, gives his number to Mike Miski. I mean, that's like the ultimate betrayal. So as soon as I heard that, I went ice cold on Catherine Killaw. Why have we not heard anything about Kaneshiro, you think? You know, I think that Kaneshiro probably is guilty of not, of being, of things getting out of his control. Maybe not being a good supervisor. But I don't think he had anything to do with Mike Miski and Louis Killaw and all that stuff. If he did anything involved in this case, it would simply be trying to make things go away because it was drama, trying to protect his employees and his, his workspace. Um, I don't think that Kaneshiro is, is what you call an actor 
in what we know so far. However, whatever else they're working him for, whatever, all the other stuff they're looking at him for, whatever that is, you can bet that they're going to be wanting Catherine Kellogg to ease their, ease the process. So whatever they're going to look for, they're going to try to go to her. They're going to leverage her time. They're really going to ask her to talk and maybe reduce her time. Yeah. Like someone here said, uh, I think Kiki Love said, uh, they never, she never really did apologize in her, in her opinion, you know, uh, and her, her and her victim statement apologized in her victim statement um you know it's kind of like maybe a hollow apology well what she did is she apologized to gerard but she never apologized to her grandma or her grandma died in february at 100 um she never apologized to that but she didn't apologize to other people and if you notice louis kelloa apologize to everybody but Catherine didn't uh this person doug said <laughs> i think it's your wife saying this actually i missed some of these comments i have to scroll with my with my finger here she said uh, a friend hooked us up with a small apartment while doug was in academy when we first moved there yeah and uh i think that's because someone's asking where you were living uh yes. this guy said uh they used to throw cats from off the roof there at KPT. They threw everything. Hey, they threw a transmission off the top story and landed on a police car. So check it out. We had a rule. No joke. There was a rule in District 5, which is where KPT is. You were not allowed to pull your blue and white in to the building because people threw stuff off the building at the blue and white. So you'd pull up to the, there's a gate, you'd pull up to the gate and walk in. Because when there'd be fights and, dude, people would, people would go to KP, like, they would take their garbage out of their apartment and they'd throw it in the elevator and press down. And so after a while, everyone's throwing their garbage in the elevator. The elevator was just full of garbage. You couldn't get in the elevator. It's just rotten, gross garbage, rats, whatever. Mm -hmm. And pe eventually people get sick of it and light it on fire. I mean, it's the jungle. Did you ever see Lean on Me? Yeah, oh, yeah. It was yep. that welcome Plenty to the jungle scene. That yeah. was KPT. I mean, it was insane over there. This guy's saying Kaneshiro's loyal to those that are loyal to him. So he said he thinks she played him, not the other way around. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. I'm pretty sure that Catherine Kilo played Kaneshiro. I mean, she's obviously an alpha female. Like you, you see how, dude. Uh, Louis Kilo is is arguably the most powerful person in Hawaii. And she's telling him what to do. And he's covering for her. I yeah, mean, were you kind of surprised that he only got like a seven-year sentence? Because he no. kind of acted like he didn't know what was going on. But he had to have known. He was yeah. involved in setting that guy up. Dude, he knew. He knew. Here's He probably didn't know the particulars. Think about it. Their marriage had fallen apart. I mean, he, she cheated on him multiple times, and she was cheating on him with that one dude, the fire captain or whatever his name was. <laughs> yeah, what a circus. And that's crazy, too, because he was like a good-looking younger dude. That's Yeah, I, I, I don't know how she been, you know, power. Dude, she, it had to have been that. I don't think it was anything else. Yeah, the power is obvious. Like, that's Unless an obvious thing. paying them to, like, you know, cheat with her, you know. Maybe she was giving them money. Well, I think it was probably – not that she was giving him money so much as she was probably like financing their lifestyle. Cause you know how she was living. Yeah. But they were driving around in Maseratis and uh, what was, they had a Maserati and a Mercedes or whatever. On a, I mean, a deputy prosecutor and a police chief dude, the police chief does not make much money on the police chief's salary. Once you, once he retires and he gets his pension, then he's making money because that's his patrol money that he made on patrol because patrol makes the real money. There are dudes making, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a year at HPD with their overtime because they do court all the time. You do that for three years, you're graduating with, or you're graduating, you're retiring with $150,000 for the rest of your life. But the police chief's salary base pay is like $100,000. So you don't even make it as much as some patrolmen. 
So I lived, dude, when I lived in Hawaii, my last year, I made 104,000 as a patrolman. I was only in six years. That's with my special duty and my court time. I made 104. I worked a ton though. And I lived in, I lived in Kulio'o, right off the beach, right by Kulio'o Beach Park. And right next to Costco or whatever, and had a good life. Um, drove up. We only had a single car. My wife didn't work. So to put it in perspective, single income. My wife stayed at home, even though she's an emergency room nurse. We wanted her to stay home with the babies. Um, and she homeschooled them. And then we lived, our rent was like 2300 a month with, with utilities included. 2300 a month, utilities included. We rented an entire house that was built off of somebody else's house. So on 104000 you could live a pretty good life. Oh, yeah. But I um, but not, not, we're not talking, but not Portlock. Yeah. We're not talking Kahala. You know what I mean? We're not, no beach house. Like they had a right. beach house. They had a beach house that another officer rented from them. So she's obviously living large. And I just assumed that they were good with their money. I mean, she owned like a solar company and a couple other things with one other police officer, one of the guys. Do um, you have any good beat stories from that area where I live? Oh, dude. Maybe like the greatest hits or something. Somebody's asking for this. I can't give Captain, you great. Captain dude, Ridiculous dude. Awesome Sauce. I don't know who he is. but He's he he's awesome. He's always <laughs> he's always a huge support. I want to give a shout out to everybody that's watching because I'm telling yeah, you. Appreciate it. Dude, the people that like are active on my social media, they're just, they've been the best. They're super encouraging. They're always here hanging out. When I was doing my lives, bonfire sessions, when I was up north. We were just hanging out, talking story. And it really helps for someone who doesn't live in Hawaii but misses that lifestyle. It really <laughs> is like I'm back there, even if it's just for the hour. But I'll tell you this. Dude, there's tons of them, but my favorite one. And I'm going to do a complete video about this and get into everything. But just for the people that are watching, since not a lot of, I'm assuming not a lot of people are on here. Yeah. But, but for the people that tuned in. There's more people coming in as so, it goes uh, okay, so there's this dude. He was a serial rapist in Honolulu. It was the biggest manhunt we had done up until this point with the Honolulu Police Department. This is 2013-2014. Three, well, we knew about six Japanese girls who, were, who had been raped in like a six-month period or four-month period. They all are about the same age, 25 years old, um, Asian, usually Japanese. I think there may have been a Korean girl or two, but they didn't speak great English. They were all what well, we call the term was Bobara, but it was like from off. They weren't from Hawaii. Um, they didn't speak the best English. The MO was always the same. A big Samoan guy would knock on their door. They'd answer the door. He'd punch him in the face and then rape them in their apartment over an entire, the entire day. He would stay there for 12 hours. Good Lord. And rape them and then make them shower. And he would like lay down with them and all this other stuff. And the FBI gets involved when it's a serial rape case. The FBI will lend their services to you because it's if it's serial rapists, like they have profilers that study MO. So they sent a profile profiler to Honolulu and he looked over the all the six rape cases that we knew of that we could connect that were all the same MO and same description. And based on what he heard, he said, We know what this guy's like. He's probably 35 years old, 30 to 35 years old. He's a Polynesian male. He is probably married, probably has children. Um, and the rush that he gets from these rapes is more than just like sexual. He, he develops a connection. He feels like a boyfriend to these girls because he would, he would go down on them and do things that like normally rape stuff doesn't, people don't do. And so based on this stuff, which I know is super graphic, but based on that stuff, the profiler gave us, uh, here's what this guy probably is like. 
The interesting thing is because he makes such a connection with them, the FBI profiler told us that he will, he will regularly drive or walk by the residents to check on the victim because he feels like he's in a relationship with them. Months later, even. So the, I don't know if the FBI gave us a grant or something. And as soon as they get us this information, I get a, I get a voice message on my phone from my lieutenant, which I still have on my phone to this day. I saved it. It'll be part of the video where she says, Doug, I have 12 hours of overtime to give away. It's plain clothes. You're working undercover for 12 hours to try to catch the sex assault suspect. So I called her back right away. And I was like, yes, I'm in. So we go to the station, me and another officer, super good dude. We check out the undercover car. We drove like, it was like a maroon Acura Integra. And they picked a random victim. Remember, we had six of them. There was three that were willing to testify. And the most recent one, she lived on Cedar Street, which was right by you. It literally goes um, Alder, Birch, Cedar, and then Kamoku. So those three streets that run from King Street down to Rycroft and behind that building you lived in, that was Alder, Birch, Cedar. They were on Malcolm Mackay. She lived on Cedar Street. They said, we're going to pick a random night and pick a random victim, and we're going to set you up across the street in the undercover car. We're going to set up in a van with a bunch of cameras, and we're going to put an officer that looks like the victim in her apartment. But the girl had long since moved back to Japan. So we have a Japanese officer wearing regular clothes in the apartment with the lights on, walking around so it looked like she was home, had a, a, a van with surveillance cameras, parked right in front of the street but there you know how parking is there's tons of cars oh yeah. it would blend in <clears throat> we're parked across the street do you remember the dairy um you remember oh, yeah. metal, metal gold yeah so they we, took up all the parking on all the all the side, all the right side. so i parked in the metal gold parking lot because the back side of metal gold is cedar street right so i parked in metal gold and we just sat there and Every time someone would walk by, someone would go on the radio and say, hey, we got two guys walking um, Makai Bound. And the, uh, so now I'm supposed to watch them. And if they, if they resembled the artist drawing of the suspect or the description of the suspect, then I would go talk to them and basically canvas the area. So maybe 20 people walk by the entire 12-hour shift all through the night. Like occasionally someone will walk by and then we'd go check it out. And it's just like a drunk guy getting out of a bar. Well, the sun comes up. It's got to be, I don't know, 630 in the morning, maybe seven o'clock in the morning. And I'm, I'm sitting back in the car in my park. This dude drives by in a red car, a small red compact car. And it's a big Sole, a big someone guy. And my partner goes, Hey, maybe that's the guy. But you say that. Because we hadn't seen anybody, right? We're just trying to keep each other awake. He's like, maybe that's a guy. And I'm like, ha ha. I'm not kidding you. Five minutes later, that same dude driving the car, Mackay bound. So he's going, remember, Cedar is a one way. He's driving Mackay bound down Cedar. Five minutes later, that same dude walks Mackay bound down Cedar. And I'm like, dude, I hear on the radio, hey, we got, we got uh, one guy walking Mackay Bomb. So we start looking, and my partner's like, bro, that's the dude that was just driving that car. And I couldn't believe my eyes. I'm like, why would a guy, first of all, it was a red car. The guy's wearing a red shirt. He's a 35-year-old, 250-pound Samoan guy. And we saw him drive by, and now he's walking by. How do you drive south and walk south? Like, it, didn't, it just didn't make sense. So I said, all right, I'm going to stop him. So I get out of the car. I walk up to him. I badge him. And I, and I said, hey, what's up, dude? He's like, uh, am I in trouble, officer? I said, no, 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 you're not in trouble. I said, this is a consensual stop. At any time, you can leave. You are not required to talk to me. But I'm canvassing the area, and I, show, I hold up the picture. And I said, we're looking for this guy. It's the rapist you've been hearing about on the news. And he goes, that looks like me, officer. And I'm like, it does look like you. <laughs> and he's like, uh, 
are you sure I'm not in trouble? I said, no, no, no. I'm just, I'm asking people if they've seen this guy. And um, he's like, yeah, I haven't seen him. I said, well, listen, I haven't talked to anybody all night. You're literally like the only dude. And I got to show my supervisors that I talked to somebody. So can I get your name and address and phone number? And he's like, sure. And he gives me his name. It's Aso Fitu Feel. And I said, um, Mr. Feel, can I take a picture of you? Because my, they're going to get a kick out of this. You look just like the dude. He's like, sure. I take a picture of him. He smiles for the camera. And then I said, where do you, where do you live? And he said, I live Queen Emma. And the Queen Emma Gardens is Chinatown. It's Vineyard and Liliha. Mm -hmm. Well, the first victim was raped at Queen Emma Gardens. So he said, Queen Emma, I said, but how, what are you doing over here? He said, my wife works at Sam's Club, which is right behind you, right? Yep. Well, victim one is, lives in Queen Emma. Victim three lives on Cedar Street. So he lives by victim one and is walking down Cedar Street of victim two or victim three. And I'm like, oh, you just come in to visit your wife? He said, yeah, my wife, I come here, I eat lunch with my wife. Well, it's like 7 a.m. So I'm like, okay. Um, how did you get here? He goes, I walked. I said, you walked here from Queen Emma? That's like a mile away. Yeah. I saw him driving that car. He's like, yeah, I walked. I said, okay. All right, well, you have a good day. I right, cut him. Well, then I go to my supervisor. I said, hey, I got this guy's info. I'm going to get another overtime bid tomorrow. That's all. I'm, I'm like, at least I showed them that I stopped the guy. Like, this one worked, and I'm trying to get more overtime. So I'm like, I turn it on. I'm like, hey, we got something. He's like, okay, cool. This will get their wheels turning. At least we got something. Dude, I woke up the next morning. Remember, all that day. Remember, that was 7 a.m. Turned in my paperwork, put in my follow-up. I was up all day, went to bed at night. I woke up the next morning at like 6 a.m. to my phone ringing. He said, Doug, this is Lieutenant so-and-so. Are you sitting down? I said, yeah. He said, you can't tell anybody what I'm about to tell you or they'll have my job. I'm not supposed to say nothing. I said, tell me, what, what is it? He said, dude, that guy you stopped yesterday, we got a buccal, we got a buccal swab today, and he's, it's a match. We got our guy. He said, that's like blindfolding and shooting in the, in the air and hitting something. He's like, one in a million chance, dude. So those FBI profilers told us he would walk by, told us what he would look like. We set up. He walks by, gives me his info, lets me take a photo, smiles, says the picture looks like him. And a, and a month later, he's pleading guilty. To, he only pled guilty to the three. And they gave him 30 years. They gave him 30, but because he pled, they busted it down to 20. So that was the biggest case the Honolulu Police Department had ever had at that point. And so, and so because I got him on a consensual stop, um, they gave me an award, and I happened to be undercover at the time. So I couldn't go to the Blaisdell where they usually did the awards ceremonies. So I had to do like a private one. I went upstairs and um, – with the chief, with Louis Kelo, and he handed me my thing, and I got pictures, you know, shaking his hand and the whole deal. And that, to this day, like, I remember that feeling, and I still save that voicemail, because I'm going to do an episode just about that case, because it was just a one, one in a million shot. It's nothing I did. Dude, it wasn't anything I did. The FBI told us he was going to go. We just put the manpower there, did what they said, and we caught this guy. I mean, it's really unbelievable that those guys can profile. If you ever watch those profiling shows... Dude, that's a hunt. That's legit. They they know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, do you have any others like in that area? Um, we had a lot of girls that lived in that building, like Japanese girls, because the owner of the building was Japanese. Yeah. You know, straight Japanese. Him and his wife both. Well, you know, so dude, they had like a lot of half the people in that area are Japanese. It's, yeah. it's Japanese and Korean. That's we we called it Korea Moku. Yeah, yeah. That was what we called it. Because you got all the hostess bars. Yep. And, you know, you, dude, if you were looking to get in trouble, that's where you hung out. <laughs> yeah. 
And, you know, speaking of the Miskey thing, you know, Mike Butenbaugh used to hang out in that area a lot, you know? Well, they had that, what was that that bike club, Imor Lounge? Remember uh, Imor Lounge? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, bikers, plenty of bikers would hang out. You know, you know that, um... I ran into Butenbaugh, there was a, a club down on Sheridan. Yeah. Almost, almost, it was kind of near the Walmart. Yeah. There, there was a little small area where there were some businesses, but so, I think it was past that. I forgot. Remember what it was. Sheridan hit King Street where there was that um gas station on the corner where they also like washed cars and it was like a you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Yajima service station. Yeah. So um dude, we constantly had problems over there. Constantly had problems over there. That was all the action. That on um, Friday I was on ATV, so Friday, Saturday nights. I would just ride my ATV through there with my lights on just for presence. But dude, when Chris Rock or Kevin Hart or any of these dudes came in to do shows, all the military dudes came out. And when military dudes came out and mixed with local boys, it was fireworks. Yeah. Because you usually got the military dudes that, let's be honest, they bring in the arrogance, the, they're, they're the man from the little town that they come from or whatever, or the big town, and they just think like, Honolulu, dude, you would know, because you spent time there. People underestimate Hawaii. Hawaii will chew you up and spit you out, especially, dude, everybody knows how to fight. Like, in, in Hawaii, the fight culture is mean. So, we're, at our police department, we train in a dojo. I mean, we actually roll in a dojo. You got to bow, you got to take your shoes off. That's, it's not like a gym, like a boxing gym. This is like straight dojo culture at, at, in, at HPD, where it was jujitsu. <laughs> the first thing you learn is rear naked. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're like, hey, this is how you get out of this because people are going to lock you up. Chances are the dude you chasing works out at BJ Penn's gym. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we had everybody knew how to fight, but that's what made it exciting. You know, this guy's asking about Yakuza. Yeah, there's, there are some there in, in Honolulu for sure. Yeah, because if you're Yakuza, and you got money, Honolulu is the place to be. It might as well be Japan. Like, it's it's Japanese friendly, right? You can yeah. get around speaking Japanese. If you don't speak English, it's okay. If you speak Japanese, you'll make it happen. And there's tons of Japanese. Everybody's got connections. But you're in the U.S. So if, if you are Japanese and have money, Hawaii is where you want to be. It's yeah, bigger. I know one young gang member. He was working... Uh... It's working like a regular job across from, uh, you know, that uh, it, it was a sports authority on Ward. There was a there was a, a popular spot right across from it. I forgot what the place was where, called. Where is it at? You know, Ward Avenue. There was a sports authority there. I forgot. Yeah. They had to change it. Something. But there was a business right across that a lot of people hung out at as a grill, bar and grill, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was a guy named Coco who worked there. That was his nickname or whatever. And he was, and because I had just came back from Japan, so, you know, I knew Kid Yamamoto and he was friends with Kid Yamamoto. And uh, so he kind of, you know, I had heard that he was over there. So I kind of went and visited him. You know, he didn't know me, but yeah, I knew he was. Yeah, yeah. Dixie's exactly. Yeah, he was working at Dixie's. That's right. And uh, yeah, I have a picture of him actually on my, my Facebook actually, but yeah, he was kind of a known to be kind of like a young uh, gang member, not anyone who was, you know, running stuff or anything like that. Well, but, I know yeah. right now, hey, so that dude, that dude that was just recently um, arrested for sex assault and attempted murder, um, he's been all over the news. They found him, they found his victim in the hallway or in the elevator bleeding from like her crotch and when they found him he's like sleeping in a pool of blood like it was a violent horrible sex assault some crazy stuff i will i won't name names because i'm working on that one too but his he's connected with the largest construction company in honolulu or in oahu mm -hmm. actually i'm pretty sure it's the biggest construction company in hawaii albert kobayashi and there's a connection there with that family and there's owners of the business that are rumored to be Yakuza. I don't know enough 
about them to speak on that yet. I'm still looking into it, but dude, everywhere you look, you, if you follow the money, it's going to come back to Yakuza. Cause if you're talking wealthy Japanese, there's, you don't, there is no such thing as like being a wealthy Japanese in Japan, but you haven't dealt with Yakuza. Like yeah. they, they are, they're the influences everywhere. So it's there and it's too close to Japan to not be a target. Honolulu is full of it from back in the day. This person, Kiki, you're saying, you know, Coco. <laughs> I didn't even know the guy personally, you know, I just went over there and kind of made an introduction to him and took a picture with him. And actually this girl lived in my bill and was like, I can't believe you took a picture with that guy. You're kind of, you're out of your mind doing this. But I was like, you know, I'm just a regular person. It's not a big deal, you know, cause I had met guys in the Japanese gyms that were gang members, you know, so it's just like, I was just saying hello to the guy, you know, so, yeah. But, yeah, I know there were some people, even if you watch some of these old shows, um, some of these case file shows in Honolulu, I know there was one, uh, might have been on Netflix or something, of, uh, there was a guy, I'd have to remember his name, but he was a, a pretty, uh, heavy duty guy in the Japanese mafia that was, you know, doing some stuff in Waikiki. And uh, I forgot his name. I'd have to look up the, the actual show it was. Well, but, uh, I know Ward Ave, Ward Ave by Queen Street. Like Queen Street's where you got all the, all the Mama-san hostess bars. Mm -hmm. And um, we were there all the time. I remember like shootings at Ginza, um, <laughs> Club Ginza, we were always at Club Ginza. I remember once, because there's that Queen Street tattoo shop. I think Ginza is one of the clubs that Misky gassed. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. I had I had heard that from somebody. I saw somebody post on social media they were there when it got gassed. It would make sense. I wonder if the dude that owned Ginza was the dude that um, Jake beat up at the office. Yeah. Because think about it. Uh Kama Aina Termite Pest Control is right on Queen Street. And then uh, there's a dude that used to, that's like connected all through there. We call it, it's Al Capone. And he had his fingers in a lot of those businesses. And so they were always watching that dude. And um, that was like our hotspot. Dude, if you would have asked me, it, as soon as I would check out my car, whether we were in plain clothes or whatever, there used to be, I don't know if anybody watching remembers Docs. Tell me if anyone remembers Docs Game Room. And uh, I never knew of any of the game room. I saw some that I think were in like downtown. You know, you could tell they were. Yeah, well. I usually, used not to go in there because people say you go in there, you're probably going to get beat up, you know, so I just wouldn't go. You probably wouldn't get beat up, but you were a mark. <laughs> if you didn't belong there, you're yeah. gonna, they're, you're, they're going to spot you real quick. But yeah. there was a game room called Docs. Docs was right off of Pensacola, like at Waimanu, Queen Street. And that was like my hunting spot. It's, that's where I, dude, every single day I went right to Docs because dudes I was looking for would be walking out of that game room. Well, the owner of Docs died. They were in a Corvette speeding through the tunnel. The, the tunnel on the leaky and smashed into the wall and instantly died. And there was this house. Anyone who's familiar with town will know the house that I'm talking about. They call it Mama's or the mansion. They call it the mansion. And the mansion was, what's that street called? Um, just, it was right by you where you lived. Kahakai Drive. So, if you, if you went down to Kapiolani and then headed towards Atkinson, you know Atkinson, how Atkinson would run to uh, Alamona Beach Park? Yeah. Right where Atkinson and Kapiolani met, there's this little street called Kahakai. And there's a house they called a mansion, or they call it Mama's. And it was a Korean lady who was like a Mama-san to... That, that was basically the setup. She would rent this house only to bad guys. I couldn't figure out. I remember talking to her once saying, how do you pick who you rent to? Because you could just rent for the night. She would, dude, she had like 
beautiful kitchen with like silver and china and like paintings on the wall and it was it was her house she lived there but she had like a lock on her door and then she would rent rooms to crumbs like dudes who were bona fide bad career criminals that needed a place to stay and they were on the run they would go rent the room from mamas and it was the back of mamas was the alawai promenade there was a gate to the back door and dudes are run through there all the time i cannot tell you how many times dudes jumped in the alawai to get away and we knew it was a big warrant if they jumped in the alawai because you're not jumping in the alawai for eleven thousand. Like you're gonna jump in the it's twenty k and above if you're gonna jump in the alawai because you're gonna catch something. Yeah, I used to work security at Ohana West. No way. Yeah, and uh, you know they every now and then they come to us and say, hey, if you can get this guy out of here, you know, if you can trespass this guy or don't approach this guy. So you know, so you knew the trespass process. Oh yeah. So how many times? Be honest. How many times did you call one police officer? And he was like, oh, the guy left already. Cannot trespass him. Uh, not too many times, actually. There were some times where, you know, you go in the room and there'd be like 20 people in there. And they want you to identify all 20 people, you know, over the radio, you know, using phonetics. And, uh, yeah, that would be kind of nervous because, you know, if they figured out what you were doing. Yeah. So sometimes you just lie. Yeah. Or, you know, just play dumb. And usually HPD would show up and they would just take over the room. You know, they would just, you know, they would, they'd eat people's food. They'd boss people around. They'd make them pour out their alcohol on the toilet, whatever, you know, they're, they would just go nuts in there. Wow. You know, yeah. like they, like we'd have to be all nice and stuff. No, when HPD showed up, uh -uh, you know. Oh, yeah. Get, yeah. You know, all 20 guys that refused to show your ID were whipping out their IDs so fast. You know, when HPD walked in there, yeah, they, if they had pizza in there, sometimes the HPD officers would eat it, you know, all this kind of stuff was, oh, <laughs> was circus, dude. Bro, that's hardcore. Yeah, I mean, they dude, would push people around. Listen, you though, know, cops, young people having parties, you know, so they Well, cops are so picky about food, because <clears throat> cops, there's one thing HPD knows, it's where to eat and yeah. where to get the good food. And people are constantly dropping off food at like the substation at Chinatown or Waikiki, whatever that never gets eaten. Don't ever bring food in to the police department. They're not going to eat it because they know the chances somebody spitting that food or did whatever. It's just too great. And one thing about cops is they're super picky about their food. So I'm tripping out that they're eating pizza from like house. Yeah. I can even tell you who it was, but I don't want to mention them on here because people might know who it was. So. Uh, you gotta, but. you gotta drop, you gotta DM me, because now yeah, I gotta know. I'll, I'll tell you about it. It'd probably, I remember exactly who it was actually, but uh, dude, we lost a really good officer, um, just a week ago, Wes, and um, he died, dude. He he just retired six months ago, and he died running on the treadmill, had a heart attack, and um, they say that. The average life of a police officer is about two years after retirement. And mm -hmm. in HPD, it's like a year and a half. And this guy died within six months. Hmm. Weird how that works, dude. Yeah, I'm trying to remember because people ask me if I had any stories. I'm trying to remember something that would involve anyone that got in trouble. Do you remember? I mean, hey, you were there. I brought up, you know. Dude, you I were mean, there when BJ Penn punched that policeman. I wasn't at the club, but yeah, I do know. Some you were in that. Honolulu. Yeah. Yeah. So he punched a dude named Oscar Pa'o. Mm -hmm. And Oscar was my martial arts instructor in academy. Yeah. So I had saw it on the news. BJ Penn had sucker punched him. Mm -hmm. And so everyone was like, yo, that's the dude BJ punched. Dude, when I, this dude is a monster. He's 6'4", 250, shredded. And bj penn punches dude in his face what is bj penn five nine and he punches yeah. six foot four yeah oscar paola was his name yeah i'm trying to remember anything that was interesting um man it's hard to remember 
you know, especially in the fight community, is pretty small. I'm trying to remember. You know, there's a guy, Tyson Nam, who's fighting in the UFC now. You know, his brother was murdered. I don't know if you ever heard about that. That was kind of one of Honolulu's unsolved homicides. Um, what was his brother's name? Jason Nam. I uh, believe I it was know. Jason. And uh, he was... The guys showed up. I think they have bandanas around their faces. or It was a hit, you know. They showed up there to kill him. And they did. Um, I think he was at his apartment or something. Um, outside his apartment. Yeah, this was a long time ago. Maybe where was it? Man, I don't even remember exactly where it was. I'm sure someone looking at this might know, like Team Hawaii Promotions might know. But, uh, yeah, um, I know, like, I see a lot of media interviewing him. They don't know that, you know, or they don't bring it up maybe. But, yeah, I mean, that, that happened. Um, if you look at his Wikipedia, it's on there. But yeah. uh, a lot of people don't know that. Um, trying to think of Dude, these particular things. I had a lot of people, when I made my Takashi 6 9 video, I had some people saying, like, there was no way Takashi was getting robbed because he was hanging with Shadi and this other dude. And um, apparently they're like, so I, I have a feeling that people underestimate Hawaii. I really do. I think that they think it's Hawaii. It's not like Philadelphia or Detroit or Chicago or whatever, but there's something to an island. There, when you know the pig trails, when you know the ocean currents, when you know the mountains, when you know all the alleyways and all the valleys, I don't care who you are, you're going to get lost. And it's hard to, like, these smashing grabs, the hit and runs. If someone wanted to kill you and get rid of your body, it is not difficult to do that on Oahu. And that's Oahu. We got a million people. Good luck on Maui. You know what I mean? Good luck, Kauai or Big Island, where there's almost nobody. You're going to disappear. When the Hells Angels were trying to get to Hawaii, they kept trying to set up a chapter, and it just wouldn't happen. We had a, we had a motorcycle club called the um, Wrecking Machines, and that was like our outlaw. It was like our outlaw bike club. And every time Hell's Angels kept trying to come over, the local boys wouldn't let it happen. And so eventually, the word on the street is eventually they patched over. The only way they would allow Hell's Angels to come to the island was to patch them over. So that happened recently, you know, like 2016 or whatever. Hell's Angels finally got a chapter in Eva Beach or something. And, and then they're bringing in the Mexican crystal meth. So... Now Hawaii's got its own, it's got a bunch more problems. Yeah, I mean, kind of getting back to the Miski thing, like, you know, because I know we've been on here for a little while, so I don't want to keep you forever. But uh, um, is there anything else that maybe you've heard that you could add? Or, I mean, I haven't, I guess, like I, I told you before, my interest came from really Mike Butenbaugh, not Mike Miski. You know, that was the guy I was familiar with. Dude, a guy named Mike Malone commented on my uh, commented on a video, and for a second, I was like, I was taken aback for a minute. But it wasn't that Mike Malone because it's obviously a popular name. But yeah, I mean, dude, plenty of people have been hitting me up, um, sharing like little stories about stuff. You know, all that stuff I can't confirm, and I would hate to say something about somebody that's not legit. Right, um, right, right. Yeah. But the stories that I'm hearing is like. Everybody kind of knew what was happening. Nobody, everybody was worried about Mike. Uh, Mike was flexing on everybody. He was getting reckless. He wasn't someone you could trust. Everyone was scared of him. I'm, I'm concerned about, like, I know people who know um, Johnny Frazier's mom. And she's, she's like, I know good friends of hers. And she's such a sweet lady and all that stuff. So I, if you remember, like, I kind of jumped the gun early on and wasn't thinking about the human connection involved in this whole case. And I'm glad that happened because it kind of recalibrated me. Now I am really focused on, like, the solutions for Johnny Frazier. I'm really interested in Rick Kelhow. 
Um, the fact that he was like Miski's right hand dude, and yep. only six months before trial, he goes missing, dude. Yeah. That's got to be something they're picking up right now. I guarantee you the FBI, which has a much bigger budget, has much more resources than Honolulu Police Department. Um, I bet you those are on the list. Yeah, you would think they wouldn't let that, that kind of go away as they're going into this case. You'd think they, someone's going to be able to tell them what happened to him. Yeah, now that people are hearing about it, especially if Mike's put away, now you got like, Tutu, Christina, who was worried, or Tita, you know. Kiki, Kiki, who are you telling to message you, Doug? There's someone commenting here saying message me. So, Kiki Love 11114. I don't know, maybe one of your, I don't recognize it from mine. So. Yeah, she, she's, yeah, she's a, she's a big supporter. <laughs> she always comes through. I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you uh, moderate how you want to do things. Um, I I know a lot Tell of Doug my, to message. She's telling you to message her maybe after this is over. So a lot of my followers, like we've become close and they can, we connect all the time. And you know, I try to. I, I want to protect the people that like call me or DM me or like, hey, this is what's going on. They kind of give me heads up. So it's been real special. A lot of people care, man. This is a case that I found out like a lot of people really care about. It touched so many people. Believe it or not, it, it seemed like it's hard to find people who care about certain cases and um, or a certain crime. But this one touched everybody. It's something remarkable about this case because it has it has corruption from like people who we put in power that are legitimate powers in the in our communities, but then also people that have this clandestine power, like Mike Miski. And so it touches everybody. Because if you're legit, Catherine Kayla and Louis Kayla meant something to you. And if you're a crumb or you're wrapped up in the lifestyle, Mike Miski meant something to you. Or if you were just a businessman and you're getting bullied by Mike Miski or bullied by Catherine Kayla, like everybody got touched by this one. So mm -hmm. this has been probably the most feedback I've gotten from people um, and from all, I mean, I, I think at least big Island, Maui, Kauai, Oahu. I haven't talked to anybody from Molokai, but what do you think about cowboy doing videos on this stuff all the time? I mean, you know, cowboys, dude, I mean, got, he lives there. So it's like, yeah, he's got to decompress. I mean, he's like, think about it. They try to take him out. <laughs> Like, people can say what they want about Cowboy. He's the one that Jake sh shot at at Kulua Ranch. He's yeah. the one that, you know, took the, the lid off of this bottle. And the genie's out now. So he's, he's running with it. And, you know, he's doing his thing. I, I would be passionate, too, if, if the dude who was threatening me and had a contract on my life is finally gets caught. So. Yeah, but I remember Cowboy had mentioned some other people. Like, I know you got that book, Sunny Sky Shady Characters, recently. And yeah. he, in one of his it. videos, he had mentioned a guy that was in that book, actually. There's the one right as, here. As being Mike Miski's boss. He mentioned shout, out, a, shout out to Kiki Love. She sent this over to me. Yeah. A guy that he mentioned, you know, being Mike Miski's boss was Bruce Perry. You know, is in the Stevedores. And he was in that book. That's why I mentioned that. Yeah, um, I lived across from... Yeah, the history. I lived across from the Perrys in Culeo. Yeah. He trains football players. There, there's a house right in Culeo Valley where, like, uh, Kamehameha players and St. Louis and, you know, Kahuku, guys will come to the garage and just, like, train. Like, yeah, so he was saying Bruce was Mike Miski's boss. <laughs> so I mean... He was saying a lot of things, so... Dude, but here's the thing. Like, every, anybody in Hawaii knows the Perry family. They know that the Perry family is, like, was wrapped up in the organized crime from back in the day. I think a lot of things have changed. I think since the police shooting. Do you remember the police shooting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think since, since the police shooting with, like, Mike Freitas and all those guys, 
I mean, everybody kind of calmed down and then went, you know, deep. And um, Mike Miski stirring the pot again. This, it's just one of those things where it really stirred the pot. Have you, re have you read that book yet, Todd? Yeah, I read it. I got, I got a, my dude. Idea. So when you start reading book. about the dude that owns those towers, you know, the twin towers going into Waikiki? Yeah. Right. When you make that turn, there's those two big towers. I won't say his name, but he owns those two towers and a, he lives out in like Kalailoa. Which and, towers are you talking about? So, you know, the, when you are turning into Waikiki from Kapilani. Yeah. You got that. It's like a condo and a hotel. They match each other. And there's like this grand entryway. I'll show you. It's right at the corner. The... I used to work at one of those, but I'm trying to see if it's the it's one you're talking about. Kalakaua... Kapiolani. Hold on a second. I'll... It's across from the convention center. Across from the convention center. I used to work at... The Landmark. It's the Landmark. Yeah, I used to work at Waikiki Landmark. Yeah, so then you yeah. know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, you know, there's those two big towers. So Across from the Landmark. Are you saying the Landmark itself? Um, I think it is. Let me see. Okay. Yeah, 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 the landmark. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because there's security at the landmark. Yeah, so the dude that owns a landmark, um, pretty sure his name's Jeff. I won't go any further than that. Um, he also owns casinos in Las Vegas with Yakuza and my bosses from Chicago and New York City and whatever. So we're all tied in. And um, I don't remember meeting the owner. I mean, my boss was Leland Nye. He was kind of in charge of the, you know, he was the, uh, what do you want to call it? Like the, the manager of the, right. Everything, you know, well, let's, let's just say, he, let's just say he's in the book. And um, he was connected to the trustees the board of trustees for Poi Estate and um, that whole scandal with selling off the plots of land and whatever, making millions of dollars. They were all connected. They were all connected, dude. That This book broke my heart. When I read it, I remember I was working special duty and I was yeah. just standing there and I was just had this empty feeling. I knew I was moving in like a few months. I just had this empty feeling like I felt hopeless. I felt like there wasn't any hope for Oahu because since the fifties and sixties, like organized crime had taken such root and people thought it had disappeared, but it had just gone underground and became more business oriented and you had less people getting whacked. You know what I mean? But you still had organized I crime. I think the poly shooting involved some guys that were in the fight world, if I remember correctly. Really? Who were the suspects in that one? I'm trying to remember. I don't remember. I'm pretty sure maybe one of the shooters was a... I don't think it was in the fight game, though. No, there were. There were some sketchy characters back then. Uh, really? Yeah, there was a... Maybe one of the guys who had fought Gussie the Morris or something. But, yeah, well, first of all, I know there was a lot of people that were involved, but the only people that pleaded guilty were Ethan... I think Robert K. Allow was one of them. I'm pretty sure Robert KLL was one of the guys involved in that. If I remember correctly, I might be wrong. Well, you, but, uh, it says he, Ethan, Ethan Mota, Kevin Gonzalez, Rodney Joseph. So there's the Joseph family. Everybody knows the Joseph. Yeah. Um, and then Kai Ming Wang. I thought Robert KLL was involved in one of those. Maybe it was a, a shooting or something. Oh, Rick Kellow? Oh, Robert Kellow was the one. He rolled up a guy in a carpet. I don't know if you're – I think it was a guy who maybe owned a nightclub or he, he, he was involved in the shooting of a guy. I think he might have been a nightclub owner. Uh, the Flamingo, Pink, La, Pink Flamingo, which was on Capulani. That may have been before you got there when it actually happened. But Kellow was the guy who shot him. And uh, – 
He fought at uh, Gussie Lamore's. I, I, Gussie Lamore's. I, we talked about that before. Gussie Lamore's was next to Pearl Harbor. It was kind of like a, <laughs> it was a real dive bar, and that's kind of where T.J. Thompson got his start of promoting fights in Hawaii. Um, the owner, Gussie Lamore's, had uh, seen the UFC, early UFC. I want to say maybe the first or second one. And T.J. had been promoting oil wrestling events at Gussie Lamore's. And uh, this was like a lot of uh, military guys and uh, Filipino girls, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was kind of like one of those kind of bars, kind of a dive bar. And the, the guy uh, asked TJ, hey, what, you think we can do this here? You know, do this kind of this. So that, yeah, TJ, they decided to try it. And they put like a makeshift ring together. It was like a total nothing ring, you know, like made of. Just, you know, I can't even describe, like, but uh, it was, like, falling apart. You know, the ropes were, like, sagging and everything. Right. And uh, so they put in an ad in the paper, and the guys that would call, like, everyone that called, there would be, like, roosters in the background, like, you know? Right. So TJ told the owner, I think someone's messing with me. Like, everyone that calls, it's the same rooster roosters. in the background, you know? But it was just a bunch of guys from the west side calling, you know? He thought it was the same guy over and over again calling him to say he wanted to fight, you know. It's so funny. He's just like, I think someone's just messing with us, you know. But Yeah, they're all from they the beach. To, yeah. You know, they managed to get eight guys together. Kavika Paolo, he won it. He was the one who won the very first uh, future brawl is what it was called. And uh, the rules were a little different. Like, uh, it was, I think maybe the second or third event, they took the submissions out. Kavika submitted everybody. And they were like, you know, let's get rid of these submissions. So it was just strikes only, standing and on the ground. You just had to beat your opponent, you know, into a wow. pool of their own blood to win the fight. You know, it was like no time limit, no weight class, only strikes, you know. So, and they used to do some crazy stuff. Like TJ would, you know, like guys would be arguing in the crowd or something. And he would, he would like hold up a hundred dollar bill and say, who wants to come fight in, you know. And they'd have, like, grudge match. Everyone would be screaming, grudge match, you know? And, you know, like, you'd have two guys come in there and fight. who weren't even on right. the bar, you know? They'd just pull them out of the crowd. And they just had, like, scrap. they had girls, like, giving lap dances in the crowd in between fights and stuff. It was it was nuts, you know? And that was kind of how TJ got his start before he moved into the Blaisdell. J.R. Palmer, yeah, absolutely. You know, J.R., I'll probably do a live with him sometime. I did a podcast with him, Johnny. Or, yeah, Josh. Yeah, J.R. Palmer. I did a podcast with him. A lot of people don't know about him. But, uh, yeah, we did a podcast. It was pretty cool. You know, we talked about the old days. And uh, I already talked to him about jumping on here, so that might be pretty cool. J.R. is kind of a guy most people don't know about and uh, doesn't talk to a lot of people. So it might be cool to do this with him. I wonder if they're, you know, I wonder if people stay connected, like the up-and-coming fighters. I wonder if they connect with the – Oh, yeah. The OGs. I think a lot of the guys that were in the game are training people. You know, Kavika trained uh, with Ray Cooper, whose son is now fighting. Kavika trained Ray Cooper Sr., Ronald John, um, Bob Ostovich. All those guys were training with him. So Rachel Ostovich is fighting now. All those guys, you know, a lot of them kind of separation goes back to Kavika. And even uh, Max Holloway, his son – the girl he was originally married to was one of Kavika's daughters. So his son is, a, you know, one of Kavika Paul Louis's nephews. Oh, really? Yeah. Kavika I know. Paul, like Max is a, you know, ex-father-in-law because they, he broke up with that girl or whatever, you know, they aren't married anymore. But uh, on a sad note, because you were, were you Navy? Yeah. Um, That Pearl Harbor shooting. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Th that was Max Holloway's... Um, what was his name? Was it Kapoy? Yeah. One of the victims. Yeah. In the shooting. Max's mother's last name's Kapoy. It was sad. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy stuff. Who, who are you talking about? Oh, JR? Yeah. JR has a lot of crazy stories. He's pretty open about a lot of those. So if you listen to my podcast with him, he pretty much talks about all that stuff. He doesn't hold much back. But if I bring him on here, maybe he'll talk about some more of that stuff. But, yeah, you might want to look up the Robert Kalow story because that was kind of a 
interesting. How do you spell his name? Because I'm not. I don't remember his last name, but you can look at like Pink Flamingo, Hawaii. It was a a murder there that happened at the Pink Flamingo. I want to say it might have been one of the the owners actually. Uh, and uh, they rolled him up in a carpet, and uh, I forgot where they disposed of him. But yeah, he was the one that was arrested for that hit, and he fought in TJ's show, maybe Future Brawl three or four. He fought a guy new named Ray, Wayne Fisher, and uh, Wayne Fisher was a Navy guy diver, and uh, he beat Robert Kalow on that show. Yeah, there's there's some different guys. There was a guy that Egan had one of Egan's fighters who hung himself. Um, you had a guy Mayhem Miller. I don't know if you knew about him. He got into I remember uh, Mayhem Miller. Yeah, he kicked in a girl's door and got into a fight with a guy that was in the house when he did it. You know, he was a – so he got some hot water there, you know. There was just some different people. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, this is all interesting stuff. I mean, it'll be cool to follow. I think when the trial happens, like you said, based on what you were saying, there's going to be, you know, some more kind of – Yeah, I think it's not, it's not far away. I think it's all yeah. – the ball's rolling now. Um, uh, the sentences have been handed down, and they're timing all this stuff right. People are going to be locked up, and there's going to be more search warrants. And who knows, dude? I know Hawaii. Everybody in Hawaii is interested now, so people are asking for it. And so the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know? Yeah, I mean, because there's so many people involved, I don't see how they can't, you know, it can't get – you know, bigger because all the defendants, you know, it'll be interesting to see, like, you know, I, I just like to see if they go, go up to Kealoha or if they just stick with Miski as the primary, you know, target of it all, which maybe that's what they're going to do. But know, bro. He, couldn't, he couldn't have operated without somebody protecting him. Yeah. I mean, I think we know that Catherine Killo was protecting him on a, on a, on a, to a certain level. I mean, the fact that he, she called my friend and told, told him to back off. Um, but on a different level, I think it was because he had so many people scared of him. Like, dude, that, so the one dude that I talked about in the video who owed jake smith money he owed jake money and so jake said i want you to rob this game room this game room was on um koakalani koakalani way which is where hawaiian brian's is yeah yeah <laughs> so on koakalani way there was a game room there and jake smith drove the dude to the place and sat across the street in the car and sent him in to go rob the game room. Well, some big 250-pound Uso at the door beats the guy up, takes his gun away, calls the police. He gets arrested for the gun, goes to jail for a couple days. And like three weeks later, Jake takes him to another game room. He goes to rob it, gets beat up at the door, gets arrested. Now, they, they're not getting arrested for robbery because the game rooms don't they don't want to testify obvious for obvious reasons. So like, I think because he had so many people that owed him or are afraid of him, he could make those people do things for him. So people were protecting him because they owed Mike. It's your typical like mafia style. You, you got to watch your back. I'm dangerous to you. So you and thereby protect me. And like, that's your payment. The loyalty is like payment. So I just, I don't know what's going to happen. I will be shocked if it goes higher than Catherine Killaw. But I think it will. I think it can on other islands. We do know that he was pushing um, Mexican cartel crystal meth. Um, so when you're dealing with that kind of stuff, like whoever's putting up money is probably helping you little. But I don't see how it goes much farther I just think it gets deeper with the same players we have. There'll be a few more players, but I think it just gets deeper. We're going to find out the events that led to certain things. We're going to find out 
when Catherine Kilo made those phone calls, like that kind of stuff, we're going to find out and we're going to get the details. But I just don't think it goes much higher than her. I think she, I think the buck stopped with her. And let me just say this: if it does go higher, I don't see us getting there. What? Why haven't we heard more people? Like I know three people have been announced as kind of flipping, so to speak. Why have not others? Because it's really important. The information that they are releasing, you have to keep in mind, they want you to know. There's a reason that they want you to know who's flipping. Because the longer they keep them, the better. Until they get to a point where they need something stirred up, then they release who flipped. And then that, it first of all, encourages other people that want to flip. It scares people who don't want to flip, who are thinking, dude... I got that letter that I know they're watching me and now these people are flipping and they know what I did. So they go and flip. Um, and it also makes people who like Mike Miski, who are going to deny it till the end, it makes them start slipping. As soon as you know, they're watching you, you start acting different. As soon as you know, you're being observed and watched, you start making mistakes because you can't hold this. For, you can't hold this together for too long. So it really does. It, every time they release something, they they are doing that for a reason. You are being manipulated. If they're releasing that info, it's because they need something to happen. They know what they need to happen, but they may have a guy who they know wants to flip or whatever. They may have a they may have a dude who's talking to him, but then disappears. Right. So he drops off the face of the earth, and he's all of a sudden not meeting with his handler. Then they release some information, and this guy gets stirred out of his hole. Like there's always reasons for what they're doing. So the people that are flipping, remember there's dozens of witnesses. We have done a podcast already, Josh, me and Doug did a couple of them. I did one with Doug on the Miski trial. And we also did one with the Dave Walker from the first 48. who's was Tulsa Homo homicide chief here where I live. He was in charge of the Tulsa homicide unit. And we did one with him. It's on Doug's YouTube channel. And uh, I did a few podcasts with Dave also. But, yeah, we've done them already. Maybe I'll send them to you or Doug can send them to you. I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on your name and I'll send them to you. Yeah, you can DM me. You can click on yeah. my profile and just DM me and I'll send you the episodes. But we'll, I'm sure we'll do more. I mean, that's why we're doing this. We had never done a live yet. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be more. I know that January 1st I'll have some new equipment. Um so I'll be able to do uh, some more lives. So you guys can ask some questions. Yeah, definitely going to do the main reason lives. I did this. Cause I already did a podcast with him. This is more so you guys could say something to him. It wasn't really for me. These lives aren't for me to interview people again. I more or less wanted other people to ask Doug questions or whoever I have on air. But uh, yeah, well, Doug, I've, Appreciate you taking the time. I know some people are actually more people are jumping in here if you want to go for a little while longer. But I'm good. Yeah. If you guys have any questions you want to put in here, just start shooting them now and I'll read them. Doug can't see them, but I can see them. But uh, mostly it's just people kind of commenting when you say something like, yeah, I hope, you know, this or that. Hey, I will say this. Um, recently I started just giving shots out to um, like, people from Hawaii who live in the mainland. Um, I've had a lot of like businesses will hit me up and you'll notice on my last video, I gave a shout out to um, get some Aloha kind grinds. And it yeah, just I saw them come in here actually. Yeah. So they, um, they just been supporting, you know what I mean? Just been showing me support. And so I want to do that because I know what that's like. And I know that people in Hawaii or people who live in Hawaii, they enjoy when they run into other people who are from Hawaii on the mainland because it's hard. It's just a different culture out here. So if you guys know anybody that's on the mainland, uh, make sure you share um, my profile with them. And I'm, I'm just going to start supporting wherever I can the people that are on the mainland. And obviously people who live in Hawaii. Um, I just want to look out because everyone's been so great. Yeah, does any, any of you guys have any questions you want to shoot here right quick? Or if you guys have anything, just type it out. I, I couldn't find out anything you're talking about. I couldn't find the pink flamingo. Were you thinking about the uh -oh. pink? Were you talking about the pink lady? Yeah, it might have been. Yeah. Oh, okay. T 
Team Hawaii Promotions probably knows about that case. There's this guy, Team Hawaii Promotions, is commenting on here. Robert Kalau was his name. I don't even know how to spell his last name. TJ Thompson would know who he was, too, but TJ's not in here. But you could ask TJ. He could tell you all about that kind of stuff. But <laughs> TJ has all kinds of stories. Maybe that's someone you should probably hit up. You know, he's kind of – he works in the movie industry now, so he's probably going to keep quiet about a lot of the stuff because people involved are – you know, with the in the movie industry, obviously, so he may not want to talk about too much of it. But uh, okay, so this person's saying, Doug, what fighting styles did you train? Maybe while you were at a HPD or, um, well, so a lot of HPD's philosophy on that was that you're going to fight how you train, and so if you had previous martial arts experience like I did, they would encourage you to obviously continue training in your in your um discipline but then everyone universally um hpd taught obviously judo style throws and um jujitsu so because jujitsu is so popular in hawaii and judo and um there's a lot of taekwondo i had trained tong sudo which is um essentially a korean version of karate i mean it's probably the closest thing to the japanese karate and it's like 50 50 hands and feet um and so i that's how that like that was i came up doing karate tongsudo and muay thai so i would train when we were at the dojo um all my strikes and when we were doing bag work or working mitts or whatever, you could tell like that I was, I had a Muay Thai influence, um, say on my kicks, but things that they taught you for developing new stuff was always jujitsu. Cause I think it's the most universal that all body styles and men and women can both learn and start applying quickly. Think about it, dude. Some of these people have never been in a fight. There are 110 pound females who have probably never been in an argument, but yet they're going to be put on the street. And so you had to teach them something. And so I wish there was more training, but when you come out of the academy, you're pretty strong um, in being able to defend yourself. I just wish that they had like a full time training program or regimen that the officers were able to do every single week. I'm convinced that half of your time as a policeman should be spent training. And um, there's just no money for that. They're just this person had a good question. They're saying, hey, Doug, what do you think about the other officers that were involved in the KLO case? So there was a lot of officers involved that weren't that weren't um, charged that they found out later didn't have anything to do with it or didn't have knowledge. Cause there's a lot of ways that people can be involved without having knowledge of it. Um, a lot of times you go off of like the instructions of your B partners or your supervisors. If they're like, do me a favor, I need you to go to this address, get a statement from this person because I have a, I have a robbery case or whatever. So you go on the radio, you say, I'm heading to this address. You go get the statement. So there's probably some of that involved where some officers went and got a statement from somebody related to this case, but they had no idea what was happening. Literally you're sent on the radio by dispatcher or your supervisor. So those guys won't have anything obviously to do with it. But then there are guys who had something to do with it, who maybe thought it was sketch what they were doing, but they did it because of their loyalty to the supervisor, not breaking any laws, but violating department policy or rather not having the probable cause that they may be needed. Um, but these guys, the guys that actually went down, they knew that they had done some shady stuff. And having been a police officer and understanding the dynamics and the politics of the police department, I have grace for them because I know that they were exploited. It's not to say they didn't make bad decisions, but... <clears throat> They weren't bullying anybody like the guys that were involved. Um, most of them were just like listening to instructions from the chief who was in charge. And the problem is there are some of them though, who knew what they were doing. 
and they're doing time. And um, I just know how easy it is, dude. Todd, it's not a popular thing to say, but it is from my perspective that everybody, me, you, or the officers you see out there, we all have like an opportunity to have done what these guys did. And people like to say they would never do something like that. But until you're put in that situation, you really don't know. I'm being honest, it's scary. It's scary to think about how many times I could have done something, but didn't. And I had thought about it before. I remember thinking like, what if I was a douchebag? Like, or what if, what if I was like <clears throat> addicted to drugs and needed money? Or what if um, I didn't have a wife and kids and like, what if I didn't, I could have been one of those dudes. I, it's just not popular to say, but all I'm trying to say is like, there's not much that separates us. People like to point fingers, especially when stuff goes down like this. They like to act like these people are monsters, but dude, we're all this close and it, it's always a fork in the road. Some of this, it's a more dramatic fork. So some of this, it's just like this little thing and you, you're, you're with the wrong people, the wrong supervisors, the wrong, whatever. And there are some people who are wonderful cops who just didn't have a backbone to stand up to their supervisors because you got to show up at work every day and deal with them. And that's what's sad about it because they're like victims of bullies. We need to figure out how to get rid of bullies. And I think that the, the majority of the people, and by majority, I mean the vast majority. I mean, an overwhelming number of them are fantastic and are good people who have kids and wives and husbands and care about what they do. But there's just some people that slip through the cracks. And dude, I don't know what to say. Like, I don't know how to make that better. But I do think that if they made it harder to be a police officer, I don't mean to become one. I mean, to maintain. So once you become a police officer, if it was more difficult to stay a police officer, you would probably weed out some of the people that are just like skating by and don't have any conviction in what they do. People get complacent. They start getting selfish. And then you got dudes that are at chicken fights who are smoking ice. And I think I got drug tested once or twice my whole career. And I just think about things like that. Like, what if I would smoked ice? What if I was an ice head? I would have been, no one would have caught me. But there's so few of them, dude. Like, I would venture to say of the 2,100 police officers that work at the apartment, by virtue of numbers, there's probably five who, like, are probably addicted to drugs. Someone knows that something's off with them. Right. And people are probably trying to help them or there's some people who don't know, but like, if you look at numbers, just statistically, dude, you're going to have five douchebags, five drug addicts and five psychopaths, but you're going to have 2,085 solid police officers. Do you think this, uh, you know, the whole Miski thing would make Hawaii safer? I never really thought Hawaii was dangerous. Maybe I'm naive, but. You know, like there's places where I live now I wouldn't go because I'd be worried of getting killed. You know, I never really felt that way in Hawaii, you know, and it wasn't like that. I was there five minutes. I was there 14 years. But do you think it'll make Hawaii safer maybe for whatever parts of it are seedy or dangerous, perhaps? <clears throat> um, absolutely. But I think that if you're thinking about seedy areas, I think that's a little short-sighted because... Hawaii is an island. So even though there are like housings, you know what I mean? Um, even though there's CAM4 and KPT, um, Hawaii doesn't work like that. Because you're not getting robbed in the housing. Like you don't live in the housing and then get robbed in the housing. That's not going to happen because you live by that dude. And he's going to catch cracks. What happens is the dude leaves wherever he lives, 
some dude that maybe ju just got out of jail. He, he's staying in Papakalea with his grandparents because he's just got out of jail, can't find a job. And he's staying with Tutu because she lets him stay rent free. He's going to go into Makiki and rob somebody. So you can't think in terms of dangerous areas, bro. If I was not a cop, I would not have survived in the neighborhood I lived in. And yep. I, I know you left in 2013. I lived in Kalihi in 2013. I was undercover in 2013. It was sketchy. And here's the difference. Todd, mainland people like you and I who understand this, we think in terms of like gangland violence, right? We think little rock, we think uh, gang, gang wars banging in Little Rock. You know, we think of like Bloods and Crips and Latin count, Latin Kings and all this stuff. Yeah. In Hawaii, also, we have Irish mob. Those are the guys that are involved dude, in a lot of homicides. In Hawaii, it's yeah. third world nation violence. Yeah. You're not going to get sliced up with a machete in Tulsa. Yeah. But I promise you, people tonight get stabbed in Kalihi. So yeah. it's more third world nation kind of violence. Everyone's carrying knives and machetes. Dude, I probably responded to a machete call every single week. Every four or five shifts, I went to a machete call where there was dudes fighting with machetes. Um, it's like a different kind of violence. And people fight. People really do fight in Hawaii. It's just they love fighting in Hawaii, which is maybe doesn't sound great. But, dude, I love that about Hawaii. They just, <laughs> like, they're so matter-of-fact. They're ready to bang. You know, like, where I'm from, people yell at each other outside of the road and they run their mouth or whatever, but you're more likely for that dude to get out and shoot you than you yeah, are for yeah. him to get out and punch you. Yeah. But in Hawaii, you will be stuck in traffic. Two dudes will get out of their car and they will bang in the roadway, shake hands, get in their car and drive away. I've seen it happen. And man, I something about Hawaii that I just love. It's just the wild West. But I do yeah. think to answer his question, yes, this is going to make it safer. Here's why. Cause there are people who now feel free, who were only doing things because of the pressure of Mike Miski. Now that he's gone, that pressure didn't leave, but it's lessening and they're getting more and more bold and their experience. Think about for the first time in their life, Miski's gone. Think of him like an umbrella that like shaded. They were, they were, he was like a rain cloud that followed them around. And now for the first time he's put, he's put away, they can breathe again. They can enjoy their families. They can like go to the park. There's so many people that he just, he just smothered. And they were only doing it because they knew that they were obligated to him. And what kind of a world would it be if they just tried to get out of the life? Mike would never let it happen. But now they're like experiencing what life could be like. So these people are now trying to live for the better. And so I really genuinely think there are less people involved in crime right now because of Mike Miski. I don't think there's a power vacuum that's going to destroy Hawaii. There is a, there is a vacuum. There is definitely going to be people that swoop in, but it's not, it's not overwhelming. And Hawaii is a better place because of what's happening. And think about the in, encouragement that the people of Hawaii have now to see that Corrupt people in legitimate power and corrupt people in clandestine power are both in jail. Like no, they're you're, they're starting to get their faith yeah. restored in the Hawaii system, because Hawaii's been beaten up for too long. It's been taken yeah. advantage of for too long, and so finally they're feeling like the sun is hitting the leaves. You know what I mean? And they're like, now we can grow. And I'm 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 so glad that it's happening. It's always been a dream of mine to like see that to see this kind of stuff happen, because. I was only there six years and I only learned about that stuff because I read this stupid book, but you got people who lived there their whole life who grew up with these people who've always heard these stories. I mean, I was taught in, the, I heard rumors in the Academy about be careful. If you pull over a Joseph or a Perry, I'm not kidding you. Yeah. I remember hearing people say, bro, if you pull over one Perry or one Joseph, it's up to you what you want to do. I'm not telling you what not to do, but they're connected. Cover, yeah. cover your name badge. You know what I mean? So, dude, if you live in a community that you're constantly, like, 
worried that uncle so-and-so is gonna yeah you know what i mean i even see it about this case you got people who are just they don't even want to talk you know i have friends who i i asked reached out to and they said man we don't even want to talk about nope. this and you shouldn't be t you know they say maybe you shouldn't talk about it either you know you hear oh, a yeah. lot but yeah it's like they don't even want to mention it and not just because of what happened but they may know someone who knows somebody who's related they may know somebody directly you know they may oh, be related to someone absolutely so, they're yeah. related or they yeah. know somebody mm -hmm. yeah. from day one the first video i made about mike miski i got emails from people i didn't know who were telling me shut your mouth but then i got emails from people that i consider wonderful great friends not police officers like civilians who were like mom I'm really close with that family. Can yeah. you, and what you said was really hurtful. And that's why I made that apology video. Cause I was like, dang, I guess I wasn't thinking like everybody's related. Like, it's yeah. just, it's hard to wrap your brain around that everybody's so connected in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And only because I knew that from being there for so long, I wouldn't have believed it. And it's hard to articulate, but everybody either Everybody either works for somebody or is a cousin for somebody. Dude, if you ask anyone in this chat if they have a family member who's HPD, they all do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, A, there's only 2,100 policemen. So if, if everybody's got a policeman in their family, <laughs> everyone's also got a gangster in their family. Yeah. So... All right, ma'am. Well, maybe we could do another one of these. A lot of people coming in and out if you want to do any more of these sometime. Yeah, dude, Some I had a blast. People who came in late. I was going to record a video, so um, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad it worked out. I yeah, I'm glad we videos. could do it. People could ask you some questions. And people said, you know, they appreciated that, you know, you're, you're like family, you know, Hawaiian family. You know, you're, I you're love so that. Hawaiian. I love that place, man. I love those people. And it's legit. It's, it's genuine. So. I'm not trying to be someone I'm not, um, but this is something that a lot of people have been emailing me and DMing me like that they love to hear about it because they feel like they can trust what I'm saying because so many people, they hear stuff in the news and you don't know what to believe. Like it's someone trying to make a point and I'm, I really am being objective. Like I want to report on Catherine Kill Law, but I also had to admit that I like Louie. Yeah. But I'm not going to not report. And that's the other thing. I'm not a journalist. Yeah, me I'm neither. not a reporter. Yeah. I just love Hawaii and I have a perspective and I have a platform. So I'm just trying to exploit that because right now people have a chance to talk to a cop where they normally wouldn't have a chance to, or they might not get a straight answer because he's still a cop. And yep. so at this point, it's like, I just get to reach out and touch the people that I've, that I served for six years and that welcomed me into the community and made my life. It changed my life. My family's direction is where it is because of Hawaii. My kids ate rice today because they grew up in Hawaii. Every single aspect of their life is because of Hawaii. And so I just love those people. And this, and then on the flip side, I want people on the mainland, people that aren't from Hawaii to get a perspective of Hawaii from someone like me, because I don't think that people give Hawaii enough credit and it just is a tourist destination and I want people to have a better perspective. And I know that it would have helped me if I had one. So yeah, I, I appreciate you having me on dude. And, and um, you know, letting me connect with the, the people who uh, have been following you. I noticed you're up to like 500 followers on Instagram. <laughs> you made it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you had me on dude. I appreciate it. Yeah, this stuff is fun. You know, I think people can ask questions and things like that. So, yeah, maybe we can do more of it. Because I know some people jumped in. This is the first time I've done it. So they probably don't even know who I am or why, right. why I was doing this in the first place. We didn't really announce it very much. So maybe we can do another one. Maybe when people can yeah. catch it at a different time, like on the weekend or something. Who knows? Yeah. Sounds good to me, dude. All right, man. I appreciate it. Take care. Hello, good my luck. friend. Talk yeah, to you soon. Take care. Hello. I'll send this out to you. All right, bro.